chapter 68 is covering um, the caring for clients with anxiety disorder. While anxiety and fear can be very normal human responses, uh, whenever this is classified as a disorder that is not normal anymore. And a lot of times we are questioning ourselves if the anxiety are just biological issues, they are learned, or they are in fact the result of some kind of unconscious emotional conflict. Or in another situation, is that a combination of all those three together? Um, definitely we know by now that physical and psychological factors contribute into developing anxiety disorders. And um, we say that because we know that a person needs to be genetically predisposed to anxiety in order to manifest the disorder once they are exposed to um, specific triggers. Please take a moment to stop this presentation and review the learning objectives. We'll try now and define the anxiety and fear. And in our modern society, for some reason, we started to um, use those two terms interchangeably. When we um, define anxiety, that will be that um, vague and uneasy feeling that gives us a, a sensation of an, a non-specific danger, something that puts, out, puts us um, on high alert. On the other hand, the fear is defined as a feeling a terror as a response or produced by someone or something that is very, very specific um, and that is perceived by the person that feels the fear as dangerous or threatening. Um, it's very human to be anxious in an unfamiliar environment or to um, be anxious or even fearful of pain, of suffering or of death. Uh, many medical and surgical clients will feel temporarily um, vulnerable. Um, therefore, they will be uh, good candidates, so-called, um, for expressing and experiencing anxiety. So this is why we discuss about anxiety and fever and fear here uh, in order to be able to identify uh, and uh, prevent those situations. And there are several levels of anxiety. We have, uh, and we classify them by the amount of anxiety that the patient is perceiving. We have what is called the mild anxiety when just their attention is a little bit increased. Um, their sensorial perception will be also expanding um, and they are very focused on a, on a stimuli. However, for this stage that is just mild anxiety, the reality is intact. The reality is not um, uh, distorted. In terms of physical manifestation, will have a slight increase in heart rate and blood pressure, and sometimes the breathing may be slightly increased. There will be noticeable perspiration in some cases, and the muscle tone will increase. We have what is called a moderate leveling and anxiety. When the person starts to uh, become easily distracted and their concentration is impaired, um, the perception starts to narrow. They, we are not really seeing the reality the way that it, it is. Um, and the problem solving starts to become difficult. Um, in terms of observing the person, we see that they are uh, irritable and they, they feel inadequate. Um, if we are looking at how do they um, present in terms of physical manifestations, we see that their muscles are tense. They may show up with slight leg or hand tremors. Um, their volume of speech, the, uh, the pitch of, the, of their voice or the rate of their speech is changing. Um, the vital signs are definitely increased and the sleep may become disturbed if the anxiety is perceived on a, on a long period of time. For severe cases of anxiety, uh, the, the attention span decreases to almost none. Um, the person cannot, be con cannot concentrate or to stay focused even if they re are successful to concentrate for a little bit and their perception is totally reduced. Um, they, feel and express an extreme discomfort. Um, and in order to control their emotion, there is a lot of effort on, uh, on their end. Um, in terms of physical manifestation, they may present with hyperventilation, dizziness, um, tachycardia, um, their fine motor movements are impaired. They have this kind of uh, twitching kind of movements and the communication is limited. Now we have a, a, an extreme level 
of anxiety that is considered a panic level when the perception is totally distorted uh, they their learning abilities will will be disabled the thoughts processes are totally fragmented um, and they cannot control their emotions um, they feel helpless the speech is incoherent the movements are um, um, completely uh, distorted in and they may present like they are in an effort to escape and in terms of other physical manifestations they show dyspnea fainting uh, tremors and uh, diaphoresis like profuse perspiration question one is the following statement true or false anxiety is a condition to be avoided The statement is false, and the rationale for it is the fact that mild anxiety is seen as constructive and can motivate the client to make and take appropriate actions in certain situations. For example, uh, it may motivate you as a nursing student to study before an exam. However, more extensive anxiety can provoke responses that can interfere with well-being. Let's see what you as a nurse can do in order to uh, provide nursing management for an anxious client. We'll start by saying that maintaining or restore the sense of calm and control uh, will help um, this patient. There are a few techniques and we'll start with building trust. Trust is the important critical element when we are developing any type of therapeutic relationship with our clients, but is especially um, uh, essential when we are dealing with an anxious client. We need to be available and attentive to the client's needs uh, and the sh you as a nurse should not leave an anxious client alone, especially during a new or potentially, potentially frightening experience. Um, this can be seen as abandonment and even briefly will tend to escalate anxiety uh, to more destructive levels. Another technique will be to um, restore comfort. And let's see how do we uh, perform this restoring comfort technique. The nurse should ask always the client um, what will make them feel more comfortable. For example, some clients um, may find it helpful uh, when you provide support in nonverbal ways. Just by remaining with them without talking, just holding their hand um, or stroking their, um, their um, arm. Some others will like to talk about how they feel. Um, However, they will be more relaxed if the nurse will be present while physically distant. So it's also important to make sure that you understand the patient's level of comfort um, in terms of relationships with uh, the nurse. How do we modify the communication? And that's a, a critical element. Always avoid to interrupt an anxious client when they talk. Verbalizing that not always relieve anxiety. However, it can be extremely beneficial and talking helps in processing information and in a way helps the patient exploring methods for dealing with their problem. You will have those patients that will not like to discuss their anxiety and, fe and fears with you. Uh, and in such cases, um, there is our duty to respect their privacy. We may offer a referral to a health professional such as a psychiatrist or a um, medical social worker uh, for counseling uh, and expertise uh, if we see that appropriate. We may need to do what is called an adjusting teaching. Um, and this comes from the point of view, if you remember when I was describing the level of anxiety, um, you remember that I was telling you that their attention and concentration can be limited. And because of that, the way that we are teaching them, the direction and explanations should be very simple and brief. And many, many times we need to repeat them, repeat them frequently in order to make sure that the patient is registering our education. We need to determine a client's level of comprehension. And we do that by asking the person to paraphrase what he or she uh, has been taught. Um, and we know that this is called, this method is called the repeat back. 
And it's very helpful because it helps us to see how much the patient not only retained from the information that was uh, given to him, but also how much they understand. Also, it is beneficial for an anxious patient to have a reduction in the sensory stimulation, such as dimming the light sometimes or eliminating as much noise or interruption as possible. We may need to help them problem solve, and this is because the anxiety will impair their problem solving ability. And the clients will look to you uh, for advice most of the time in decision making. Well, probably remember that we need to avoid influencing our clients' choices. And instead of that, we need to follow what is called a step-by-step problem-solving process. And we need to teach our patients how to do that in formulating and in, in establishing their decisions. We need to help them identify what causes the problem. And the next step will be to determine the cause for the problem. In the next step, the third step, we'll explore possible solutions while in step four, we'll ask the patient to try and define the pros and cons for each of those possible solutions. The last, the last step of this step-by-step um, uh, -step problem solving process will be selecting the choice that is the most compatible with the personal values of our client. The last element will be ensuring safety. The people that uh, a person that experiences a panic level anxiety, especially the extreme type of anxiety, they can act impulsively and sometimes they may endanger their own safety. We need to always stay calm around them in order to reduce their anxiety to a more manageable level. It's always the best to have only one person interacting with a client that has a panic anxiety attack because by having more than one person that will expose the client to multiple sources of stimulation and may add or increase the client's agitation. If we have a client that is by far unstable, we need to avoid touching them or getting physically close without their permission because they may see, uh, be seen as an intrusion and they may, that may increase their level of anxiety. Question number two, is the following statement true or false? It is important to adapt client education to a form that can be assimilated by an anxious client. The statement is true in the rationale. It is important to adapt client education to a form that can be assimilated by an anxious client. The assessment must be performed to determine the client's learning style, level of comprehension, and so forth. Information must be given in small amounts and repeated to assure comprehension. We'll start now discussing the anxiety disorders, and um, they can be defined as a group of psychobiologic illnesses that are generated as a result of activation of the autonomic nervous system. And from this one, mainly the fight or flight part, which is the sympathetic division. Unfortunately, they tend to be chronic and sometimes they appear without any logical explanation. And there are a few types of those and we'll discuss them. Um, we'll start by discussing the generalized anxiety disorder. And the main characteristic of this condition is that the patient is chronically worrying on a daily basis for six or more months. That's a criteria for diagnosis. And in most of those patients will have more than one focus of worry. Um, for example, they may worry about their finances and job performance and personal health. So you can see that there are more than one focus. There are more than one area that they are concerned about. And in most of the cases, their worrying is out of proportion with the reality. There will be some other signs and symptoms that will accompany the client's uh, anxiety. Usually, when this type of patients are looking for medical attention, uh, tests will result, tests will fail to um, find a or um, diagnose a physical disorder that can produce the signs and symptoms that are seen. And um, I will give you some examples of other conditions that may 
uh, present with similar signs and symptoms as anxiety. Um, we may have mitral valve prolapse that can come and present with palpitation um, and um, uh, a change in the breathing rate, especially when the palpitations happen. Uh, hypoglycemia has a whole range of uh, signs and symptoms that are very similar with an anxiety attack. Hyperthyroidism, and especially when the patients are on very high levels of uh, thyroid hormones as a result of a hyperfunctioning gland, again, they can show um, signs of um, increased heart, um, heart rate, and they can have uh, increased met metabolic rate with increased perspiration. Premenstrual sy syndrome or menopause that are hormonal conditions can show with similar signs and symptoms. Dementia, uh, the abuse of psychostimulants of, as cocaine, caffeine, or weight loss drugs, or in some cases, uh, sedatives, uh, withdrawals, um, may come with the same types of signs and symptoms. So what do we need to do uh, in terms of managing anxiety? We need to understand, first of all, that it's, anxiety is a normal um, reaction. And the, it's a universal experience about real life concerns. We need to teach our patients how to avoid focusing on negative or worrisome thoughts especially if they are unrealistic and they do not reflect the actual reality. We will teach them to repeat positive self-statements that will increase their ability to cope. We'll share feelings that are supportive with others. We'll teach them breathing techniques on how to breathe deeply and perform these uh, exercises that will allow for muscle relaxation whenever they are feeling uh, overwhelmed. We'll emphasize how important it is to limit any type of stimulating substances like caffeine. We'll teach them uh, assertiveness techniques that will uh, prevent them from becoming overwhelmed by eliminating all those unnecessary activities. In terms of relaxation techniques, we can add um, meditation, yoga, or um, how to schedule body massages to uh, relax. We need to emphasize the importance of sufficient sleep and how important it is to have some active exercise on a daily basis. Let's look now at the second condition, and this will be the panic disorder. And this represents one of the most extreme manifestations of anxiety. And people who uh, are affected, uh, affected experience an abrupt onset of physical symptoms and terror um, will show with intense apprehension tachycardia, palpitation, chest pain. Um, they have this kind of choking sensation. They will hyperventilate. And as a result of that, there will be lightheadedness. Um, they will feel the impending sensation of doom and the fear that they will are dying, they are losing control, they are going insane. Now, those episodes may last minutes, um, usually under one hour. And in most cases, they will subside on their own uh, spontaneously. We talk about those episodes as attacks because they interrupt the period during which the client is totally asymptomatic. For those type of patients, their first instinct, most of the time when a panic attack starts, is to escape, to go to, or to go or to search for a safer place. Um, Whenever we have someone that has an unexplained flight from work or school, um, that can be sometimes the first uh, manifestation of a panic attack. People that experience a panic attack um, are often at a loss to identify the cause, but they will associate the location or an activity as a precipitating event, and that can help. Most of the people are able to cope with their disorder by avoiding the situations or the places where the attacks have occurred in the past. So in some cases, uh, those attacks reoccur in a variety of circumstances. Um, people with panic disorder will develop what is called um, agoraphobia. And agoraphobia is the fear of experiencing a panic attack in a place that is public. And as a result of that, to be publicly hum humiliated by, by this behavior in front of a lot of people.
to continue now describing the anxiety disorders, and let's talk about the phobic disorders. Those are, uh, per definition, phobia means fear. Um, and in this type of condition, the person will manifest an exaggerated fear, and that can be, and most of the time it is, irrational, uh, being afraid of insects or animals or um, of a wide range of life situations such as uh, riding a roller coaster or flying in an airplane. Side note, that's why I'm the most afraid of. Um, and they will, um, and this is because those situations are perceived by that individual as potentially dangerous. So let's see what happens when a person that has this kind of phobic disorder is exposed to the, to the phobic stimulus. Um, the symptoms of anxiety that are experienced, they become, they increase in uh, intensity. They become more severe uh, or they may reach a panic level. Um, and the person with a phobia can go to um, extremes in order to avoid the object of their uh, phobia. Most people with phobic disorders are totally aware that uh, this is an illogic um, fear and unrealistic. However, however, they feel disabled uh, in terms of uh, overcoming the feelings uh, that are perceiving. Um, I will give you an example of a very uh, common type of phobia would be the social phobia. Um, and as an example of social phobia, um, it's also called social anxiety. Um, is that fear um, when you need to perform in front of others uh, or the fact that you, your performance or your presence may capture the attention of others? Um, it may be um, re related to public speaking. Um, they will not be, the patients will not going to be able to act or sing. Um, it may be related to just eating in front of others in a restaurant uh, or attending a party um, where the attendings, in, in the attendance, the guests uh, may be strangers. We are looking now at another type of anxiety disorder that is called the post-traumatic stress disorder. And you heard a lot about uh, PTSD that um, is related with all kinds of life situations. And I will give you some examples uh, witnessing uh, a murder or a violent crime, um, witnessing the torture of a person or an animal, um, escaping a, um, a dangerous situation or a dangerous crash of a car or a, an industrial explosion, um, being involved in military action and seeing friends uh, or uh, public being killed in the line of duty, um, being the victim of uh, a rape or abuse uh, surviving a natural disaster can be another event uh, that can cause uh, PTSD, just as like a flood or an earthquake or a tornado. Uh, being trapped um, in certain uh, very small and confined spaces, like an elevator in a subway, uh, or being taken hostage. So those are examples of situations that can generate the PTSD. And the PTSD is defined as a condition um, that uh, incorporates anxiety response um, that is delayed by three or more months after the emotional traumatic experience um, was perceived initially. The circumstances of the traumatic event involve actual or threatened deaths or injury to self or others. And they, as a result of that, they produce fear and helplessness or, or even horror. Uh, the first stage of dealing with a situation will be to detach yourself from others. And this is called the physical numbing. Eventually, um, while you're overpassing that stage, you become no longer stifled to the, to the memories. And months and sometimes years later, the memories may resurface. Um, and they resurface usually in recurrent nightmares or flashback. And during those experiences, the person will re-experience the precipitating um, event. Um, in order to suppress symptoms of guilt or grief or anger, some of the PTSD patients will start abusing substances such as alcohol or other mind or mood altering drugs. Um, 
they may also respond aggressively uh, if startled from sleep. Um, and this is actually a simulation of an act of self-preservation. Um, those who suspect that they may have PTSD always should be referred to a mental health care professional for a definitive diagnosis. Let's talk a little bit now about the obsessive compulsive disorder, which is manifested in a client that performs of an anxiety relieving ritual, a compulsion, in order to stop, to terminate a disturbing, a persistent or reoccurring thought, an obsession. So obsessions may involve a variety of concerns and, and um, they can be not like now in this situation with the uh, with a pandemic, you may have those people that are afraid that they can be contaminated with germs um, and they will perform the compulsion, the ritual many times in order to prevent the contamination. Those thoughts usually are very intrusive and people with OCD, they cannot dismiss them from their uh, consciousness. So that makes them being feeling anxiety. In order to relieve this anxiety, the OCD patients will perform a tension relieving compulsive act. And that can be, it will fall in one of the following categories. It can be either cleaning by repeatedly scrubbing surfaces. It can be washing, like repeating ba bathing or hand washing. It can be repeated checking, verifying if the doors are closed, the iron is unplugged and all kinds of situations like that. It can be counting, um, such as a bank teller will make sure that the money um, in the cash drawer is accurate. It can be touching, um, like in the feeling that you have a lucky charm that you need to touch in order to, um, to avoid the anxiety. It can be hoarding, uh, accumulating items that are useless or unneeded, or repeating, just saying the same phrase of prayer many times, and by doing that, they think that they can prevent an, um, a traumatic event to happen. So those patients are feeling compelled to perform the same act repeatedly, and usually for a specific number of times or in a very specific type of sequence. Most clients with OCD, they do recognize that their thoughts and behavior um, may be ridiculous. However, they are not able to stop them from producing uh, on their own. They need help to stop it. Um, involved in the uh, development of anxiety disorders. And by now we have enough genetic studies that suggest that many of the patients exhibiting um, anxiety disorders um, have been found to have some familial patterns. So in other words, there is a suggestion that there may be an inherited faulty physiology or maladaptive learning or um, acquisition of some personality traits uh, modeled after those displaying by significant others. And regardless of those uh, mechanisms that were identified, the disorder uh, will manifest itself mainly through um, uh, pathology of the structures uh, involving the limbic system. So let's, let's review a little bit what the limbic system is. The limbic system represents a, a ring of neural structures that they are situated deep um, under the cerebrum. And it is uh, made up of portions of the thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and some interconnections with other structures. Um, and among those other structures, we can mention the cingulate gyrus, the fornix, and mammillary bodies. In other words, the limbic system uh, is involved in a network um, generating and coordinating emotions, survival, and behavioral responses. Um, in addition to that, is also involved in motivation and learning. Responses to any type of stressor are conducted through the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And we'll discuss that a little bit now. Uh, the psychological sense of a danger uh, as a stressor will determine some neuroendocrine changes. And they begin at the level, they start at the level of the hippocampus. They will be passed through neuroendocrine pathways to hypothalamus, from hypothalamus to pituitary and adrenal glands through what is called the HPA 
hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. In other ways, this axis is specially developed and helps in managing stress by inducing a fight or flight response along with uh, secretion of neurotransmitters as norepinephrine and epinephrine um, along with cortisol. Any type of impairment within the system may result in either an amplified or unrelieved stress response. And this will interfere with a negative feedback loop that should decrease the HPA response um, in, um, as, a, as a result of stimulation of it. There are also some additional uh, biochemical mechanisms that contribute to uh, producing anxiety disorders in our clients. Um, it can be a malfunctioning a dysregulation of gamma aminobutyric acid, which is a um, neurotransmitter that is the main action for GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, is to the main function of it is to buffer or extinguish, uh, eliminate the activity of norepinephrine, norepinephrine when it's possible. Another biochemical mechanism that was suggested is uh, a depletion in serotonin that may explain why in some of the clients with, with anxiety, um, there is also a development of depression or how they improve when they are receiving treatment with antidepressant drugs. Question number three, is the following statement true or false? Anxiety disorders can follow familial patterns. The answer is true. Anxiety disorders can be found to follow some familial patterns, and some studies may indicate that neurotransmitter involved that trigger uh, biochemical changes are the main cause for that. We'll discuss now the assessment of a client with an anxiety disorder, and we'll look first of all to signs and symptoms. So anxiety may produce um, a wide range of symptoms, um, and the patient may present with behavior, um, signs and symptoms, cognitive and emotional signs and symptoms. Uh, however, most of your patients will look for uh, medical treatment or medical help whenever they have the physical signs and symptoms, all those that will involve the cardiovascular, respiratory, every, every sign and symptoms that we described at the beginning of this lecture. Um, they may have neuromuscular, gastrointestinal, or even uh, integumentary problems. They may be concerned about palpitation and being uh, restless. Um, they may be chronic fatigue. They may have tension headache. They may have sleep disturbances. So most of the time, they will look for, they will search for help, medical help, when they are experiencing those uh, symptoms. When we examine them, in most of them, the blood pressure may be elevated and their heart rate may be in, may be increased. And usually, they too acknowledge that they have uh, a bunch of unrealistic worries or fears or they um, may have exaggerated startle reactions. Um, in other patients, especially those with PTSD, they may experience flashbacks uh, related to previous traumatic events. Um, and they know and they will describe how they avoid situations that can provoke the system. Um, and in some cases, for those that they have the OCD form of the anxiety disorders, uh, how and when they perform their ritualistic behavior. In terms of diagnostic findings, um, we can perform on them electrocardiography. And most of the times, um, our diagnostic findings um, in terms of lab um, investigations will be normal. Uh, we can do a PET scan or a CT scan in order to describe and um, being able to um, observe the abnormal brain use of glucose in the clients with anxiety disorder. Uh, in some patients uh, where MRIs were performed, um, there was a demonstration of an atrophy in some uh, brain areas that have uh, been identified as having been related to selected anxiety disorders. How do we manage uh, a patient with anxiety disorder? Uh, so we have a range of um, possibilities of treating those patients. And let's start describing the, the medical management. Um, so this will include a combination of drug therapy with cognitive and behavioral psychotherapy. The drug therapy may relieve the symptoms that are associated with anxiety, 
but will not eliminate the cause of fear, the actual cause for the condition. Um, however, once the drug therapy uh, starts, the client will be uh, more willing and able to deal with the issues that are affecting their daily lives. In terms of drug therapy, um, we have two types of drugs that we can use. We have those that reduce or block the levels of norepinephrine and those that will normalize the level of serotonin. Um, and those are the most uh, common drugs that are uh, prescribed to uh, patients with um, anxiety disorders. They are classified as anxiolytics, as beta-adrenergic blockers, as central acting sympatholytics, and in some cases, very, very selective cases, we can use antidepressants. Um, let's discuss a little bit the, uh, the anxiolytics. Um, those are drugs that, by their actual name, they relieve the symptoms of anxiety. And in some cases, because of that, they are also called or referred as minor tranquilizers. And this is because we want to differentiate them from the major tranquilizer or the antipsychotic drugs uh, that are treating schizophrenia. So the uh, anxiolytics will include benzodiazepines like Xanax, uh, lorazepam, which is the Ativan, diazepam, which is Valium, oxazepam with a sterex, um, and um, non-benzodiazepine drugs as buspiron or uh, buspor. The second category of um, drug therapy includes the beta-adrenergic blockers. Um, the, the reasoning, I will explain now the reasoning behind prescribing this type of medication. The receptors for norepinephrine are called alpha adrenergic and beta adrenergic receptors. The beta adrenergic receptors for norepinephrine are located primarily in the heart and in the lungs. Whenever there is a high level of norepinephrine in the blood, it will stimulate, overstimulate the beta adrenergic receptors. And as a result of that, the heart and the lungs will be in a, state of high, in a state of hyperstimulation. As a result of that, you will have your patient experiencing um, palpitation and increased heart rate, um, forceful heart contractions, dilations of the bronchi. In other words, their body will be in a continuous state of fight or flight. And this is the result of definitely hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, while I'm not always able to reduce their sympathetic over response, I can prevent the effect of it, of it on the organs, on the body. And that we can do that by blocking the beta adrenergic receptors with drugs. And by doing that, we prevent the norepinephrine by binding to those sites. The uh, typical drugs that we are using are propranolol uh, or inderol, atenolol or atenolamine, or metoprolol, or loprosol. So beta-adrenergic blockers are frequently used for people with social phobia. They do not cause sedation. They do not produce tolerance. They are not addictive. Um, so can um, lower blood pressure. And as a result of that, um, they can cause episodes of dizziness or fainting, especially when your client may rise quickly from a lying or sitting position. So those will be some elements that you will need to educate the patient, especially at the beginning of the treatment um, in how to behave. Some other major side effects of the beta adrenergic blockers will be bradycardia and they may increase the blood glucose levels. The central um, acting sympatholytics will block alpha-2 receptors for uh, norepinephrine at the level of the uh, brainstem. And as a result of that, they will, in consequence, will reduce the heart rate and the uh, blood pressure. Uh, some examples of those drugs will be clonidine, the catapress, or methyl dopa, or aldomet. Um, so these drugs are mainly prescribed to control primary hypertension. However, they can have beneficial effects in um, people with anxiety disorders that they can, that have as an associated element elevated blood pressure. Also, clonidine is used to control hypertension in those patients that will experience withdrawal symptoms, 
when abruptly abstaining from alcohol or anxiolytic therapy. The side effects associated with central acting sympatholytics will include, because they are working at the brainstem level, sedation, dizziness, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention. They will also cause an elevated blood glucose, just like beta blockers do, fatigue, erectile dysfunction, and the diminished libido. In some patients, you may observe rash or, um, as a side effect, uh, some might describe depression. The blood pressure in the patients that are receiving this category of, of um, uh, medication, and the blood pressure needs to be monitored on a regular basis. And just like with the beta blockers, your patients need to be instructed to rise slowly from a sitting or lying position to avoid the orthostatic hypotension. If it's prescribed, to a patient that has diabetes or is borderline diabetic, um, they, those patients may need to um, um, check their blood glucose levels uh, more frequently or to have their medication for diabetes readjusted. Uh, antidepressants. I was telling you that there is a very special category of anxiety disorder patients that will be described antidepressants. Uh, for those, we can prescribe the SSRIs uh, as fluvoxamine, uh, Lavox, or sertraline, Zolos, uh, paroxantine, Paxil, and fluoxantine, Prozac. We can prescribe tricyclic antidepressants as well, such as uh, anaphronil uh, or sertraline, which is Zolos. For PTSD patients, um, SSRIs um, is uh, Celexa, Italopram is, is good, and they have good results. Um, and from the TCAs, amitriptyline or Elovil or imipranine, tofranil have good results in, the, in this category of patients. We are done now looking at the drug therapy. Let's look now and describe a little bit about the psychotherapy. The psychotherapy will involve uh, talking with um, a trained uh, person that can be a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a licensed clinical social worker, a clinical nurse specialist, or a mental health counselor. So you see it's a wide, a wide range of uh, professionals that can uh, perform this activity. And some of our clients will respond better when the therapy sessions are conducted one-on-one, -on -one, where others, especially those with PTSD, will respond better to group therapy. Regarding the cognitive therapy, um, Let's define it first. The cognitive therapy is a type of psychotherapy in which the therapist will help the patient changing, altering their irrational thinking and correcting their uh, beliefs that are wrong. And in addition to that, the therapist will replace any kind of negative self-statements with positive ones. In other words, the th therapy uh, main um, method is thinking that is not the event that produces the anxiety, but the way that the individual is perceiving the event or the situation. So by reshaping our client's point of view, the disorder can be minimized or even eliminated. In addition to that, we can do what is called behavioral therapy. And this will is a therapy that will uh, try to extinguish any type of undesirable responses. And we do that by teaching our patients how to adapt, by how to use what is called adaptive technique. Um, this type of therapy is used for phobic disorders, for OCD uh, patients, and is called desensitization. In desensitization, we provide emotional support while gradually we expose a person to whatever provokes anxiety. If the anxiety starts to escalate, there is someone near the client that will coach the client to engage and, and teach them how to engage in forms of distraction or to perform relaxation or breathing exercises in order to overcome those symptoms that start to show up. By exposing gradually the patient to the stressor that causes the phobia, the client will start to tolerate in higher and higher amounts, in, in mainly the time that they are exposed to that, and they will start to tolerate the 
anxiety provoking experience um, and will be able to deal with that. The nursing management will include, first of all, the assessment of the patient and will um, need to observe for the evidence of the level in defining, not only just observe the level of anxiety. Um, we'll need to um, ask the client to express their anxiety by offering open end questions such as, How are you feeling now? That allows your client to come in and present exactly how do they feel. Don't interrupt them, just let them uh, express their feelings as much as possible. We also need to um, ask them um, regarding what did they do in the past? What was helpful? What helped them uh, to overcome the signs and the symptoms? And we also need to make sure that during the assessment, we inquire about any type of medication that was prescribed for other conditions or they were um, administering to themselves that they can be over-the-counter drugs or herbal remedies or stimulants or tranquilizer uh, because they may interact with any potential future treatment that can be recommended. We'll need to diagnose, plan, and, uh, and intervene in this, uh, in this type of patients. And we'll start by reducing as many external stimuli, um, such as uh, bright light or noise or even activity around them to allow them to um, uh, keep their attention focused and, um, and being able to concentrate. Always please stay uh, calm when interacting with those kinds of patients. Whatever happens in their environment rubs on them and gets transmitted and they increase their level of anxiety. People that are calm around them helps them calm down. Um, make, in, in the same category, make sure that um, you're having a position that is at least an arm length away from your client um, because invading an anxious client's personal space may increase their discomfort. Um, avoid touching um, without first asking the permission is the same thing that we discussed before that um, an anxious client may um, read this um, approach as unexpected and threatening. Start establishing trust um, by allowing the client to speak and keeping your promises. Whenever they have those kind of uh, severe anxiety, uh, make sure that you stay with the patient. Remember that those moments can be dangerous for most of our patients. Because their attention and concentration is limited, and remember that whenever you're providing instruction or you're asking them to perform any task, um, have them in the correct sequence. Do not overwhelm them. Keep them one step at a time so they can focus and perform them. Um, we can um, teach them how to relax um, and whenever needed, um, we will be in charge of administering the, um, the drug therapy.